Hello, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Dave, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I'm joined by my colleague, Mariam. Um, and yes, we're gonna be talking to you about, um, there we go, migrating from DPTK to AFXDP for high performance networking in Kubernetes with the help of VPF, man. The title was so big it barely fit on the slide. Um, I am a very minor part of this story. So I'm, I'm the bit on the end, the of BPF man. Uh, Mariam has all of the cool content about the actual AFXDP DPDK migration side. Um, but we're gonna run through it in reverse order. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about BPF man, what it is, why it exists and how it's helpful in this case. And I'm gonna hand over to Mariam to take you the rest of the way. So BPF man. Um, it was not always called BPF Man. Uh, it was a project I started about just over two years ago. Um, it was called BPFD when it started. Um, some of you may have heard me talk about it before. Anybody? Maybe? Yeah, a few people. Fantastic. Good, good. Um, so BPFD, the whole idea behind the project came from me starting to play around with BPF starting to deploy some programs uh, on just Linux host and then furthermore into Kubernetes and realizing it was a real pain. Um, there are a lot of annoying things in the BPF API, how some programs behave differently to other ones. Some will stay attached once the program that loaded them exits, some will disappear. Um, and I felt like we could do a better job of abstracting some of that complexity away. And initially I thought, hey, we're gonna write a daemon. It's gonna be like system D, but it'll be for BPF and it'll be amazing. Um, as time passed and um, some conversations with folks in the community, we realized that a daemon might not have been the best choice. Um, and we also realized that there are lots of other people loading BPF and we might not always be able to kind of police or look after what they were doing. So uh, in the last six months, we've completely rewritten BPF man from the ground up. Uh, the name is a contraction between BPF manager, BPF man, with a slight fedora hat tip over to Podman, who uh, trailblazed the way in the container space. Um, so we've now decomposed BPF man into being more of a tool set, uh, some sweet, a suite of tools that you can use for managing your eBPF in cloud native environments. So we're paving the way for some cloud native eBPF. So what that means uh, in terms of BPF man and the way that we're doing this is that we have custom resource definitions for BPF programs inside of Kubernetes. Um, all of those CRDs are served by controllers. Uh, we have a CSI plugin that does BPF file system provisioning and everything's packaged up uh, using kubeyaml. You can install it as an operator. You can install it using customize. There's a whole few uh, myriad ways of getting this installed on your cluster to help with your BPF program management needs. Now, where some of the cool stuff comes in, at least as far as I think is cool, um, in order to make this work in Kubernetes, well, the first problem we had to solve was, how do I take my cool BPF program that I wrote on my machine and get that onto all of the nodes in my cluster? And we figured, well, we already solved that problem for containers, so why not just reuse that entire same pipeline? So we're able to package BPF bytecode into container images, um, push that through a registry, and then uh, BPF man's able to pull that down, load into the kernel, all of that good stuff for you. The neat thing about that is that all of the tooling for uh, software supply chain now can equally apply to BPF programs the same way that it does to the rest of the stuff there. So we can use tools like Cosign to go and sign our containers, which gives us signatures for the stuff that you're loading into the kernel, which is kind of neat as support for that in BPF land just hasn't quite uh, matured yet. Uh, we're able to do kind of signing today. Um, and it allows us to verify uh, with a, a little bit more work where these programs have come from. So a little piece of work I'm doing on BPF Man at the moment is trying to integrate some more of the uh, policy-based verification. So you could say, I would like to trust BPF programs that have been published and signed by somebody with a redhat.com email address or an isovalent email address or a Datadog email address, but no other programs. Um, so we'll have support for that very, very soon. 
Uh, finally, I said that BPF Man is now a suite uh, of tools. So aside from loading BPF programs, we're doing some things around the observability of BPF programs as well. So we have two other little tools, uh, one of which does BPF metrics export into OTEL. Um, so that will grab some interesting metrics from the BPF subsystem about loaded programs, about maps, about memory usage, and export that in a way that you can use it through your existing observability tools. Uh, we also just recently merged a log exporter, which is grabbing logs uh, from Audit D. So it will tell you every time a BPF program has been loaded on the system. It will give you some context over who loaded that program. And again, you can ingest that into your telemetry and use that uh, in any way that you see fit. So in terms of how BPF Man works for program loading, uh, we have a very high level declaration of what you want to do, which is your CRD. Um, in this case, it's, hey, BPF man, uh, please deploy this TCBPF program to the network interface ETH0. Um, and that is the state that gets pushed into Kubernetes. And BPF man's controller will pick that up and figure out that it's got work to do. The only part of this that runs privileged is BPF man. So BPF man is the only thing in this environment that needs the permission to load BPF programs. Uh, is able to fetch your kernel code uh, from an OCI image, uh, pull that down, load that into the kernel, verify the signature. And then in order to make the user space side unprivileged, we use the BPF file system, which is a virtual file system available in Linux. So we're able to go and pin all of your maps onto there so that the user space code without any additional privileges is able to go and read those maps. So if you've got a read-only workflow that you want to use, then you can be completely unprivileged inside of Kubernetes, which is something that we really, really wanted to enable. But this workflow is not for everybody. Um, if you are doing things like compiling programs on demand or your eBPF use case is a little more advanced, it's not going to work because you can't always push your stuff over to a registry. So what we have coming in kernel 6, 9, thereabouts, is a new patch called BPF Tokens. And what that will allow BPF Man to do is here act as a kind of token issuer. So we can keep the same architecture. In this case, you want to deploy a pod that's using BPF programs. BPF Man will then go and provision the file system for you. And it can then go and issue the program with a token to say, hey, you're allowed to make these BPF syscalls. It's all good. Um, you don't need additional privileges to do that. Your token is your privilege. And then you can equally run in unprivileged mode, making the BPF syscalls to load your programs. Um, so that's still work in progress. Uh, we're figuring out how exactly to make that work, but that'll be landing uh, as soon as we can kind of get our teeth into the, the kernel patch and figure out how it's going to work. So with that, I will hand you over to Marion to talk about AFXDP. Okay, so I guess let's start with what is AFXDP. Um, so it's an address family that's optimized for high performance packet processing applications. It promises DPDK-like performance, uh, but with a standard Linux networking interface. It literally attaches a VPF program directly onto the interface. And you know, if we want to be really specific, it's an XDP program that's capable of redirecting packets to an AFXDP socket that sits in user space and then your application consumes things from that AFXDP socket itself. So, you know, you might be wondering, well, you know, is this supported in DPDK? What's the story there? And actually, AFXDP has been supported in DPDK since its uh, inception. It's available via the AFXDP PMD. And what I really want to highlight here is that that PMD is actually using your standard Linux ICE I40E driver, it's not using the, if you're familiar with DPDK, it's not using VFIO PCI or IGB UIO. So in essence, it's the actual Linux NetDev that's being um, consumed by this AFXTP PMD. And if you want to use it as part of your DPDK application, you simply need to pass a command line argument, which is the argument we see here on the slide, this minus minus VDEV argument. Um, what's really cool, or what I think is cool, is that it actually gets consumed as part of the core arguments at every single, at every single DPDK application startup. So if you want to transition your DPDK app from using you know, its existing PMD to AFXDP, all you actually need to do is pass this minus minus VDEV command line argument, and boom, it's, uh, it's done. 
No other application changes should be needed from the DPDK point of view, but obviously if you're deploying with Kubernetes, then you might want to take a few things into consideration, and we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. But I guess you might be wondering, you know, why? <laughs> why would I want to do this? Out-of-the-box benefits would include observability and portability, and even maybe from a sustainability point of view, if you want to move from a polling model, something that's purely interrupt-driven, then this is something that you would leverage. Uh, the other thing that, it, that uh, you, know, you get out of the box is that you can use any standard uh, Linux tool for configuring, managing, or observing that network interface. Um, and then you know, the, the higher investment benefit is that you can uh, pretty much uh, use a CUPS or a control and user plane separation type um, architecture for your application where you essentially split the networking stack where the kernel is your control plane and your DPDK app is your data plane. And you could accomplish this by writing something as simple as a Netlink agent, for example, that relays routes or other relevant information up into user space for your app. So you get this hybrid networking stack, as I like to call it, and the, pa the, the packets get automatically um, you know, diverted to the right point for processing. So if it's control plane traffic, it goes straight to the kernel. If it's data plane traffic, it goes up into user space into your app, and your app only has to worry about processing the traffic that's actually relevant to it. And you avoid this previous model of having to re-inject packets into the kernel from user space. Okay, so provisioning. Um, if you provision a DPDK application or service today, you're probably using the SROV device plugin and CNI. You could continue to use them. Um, the issue would be that your pod would have to be privileged, your application pod would have to be privileged to use AFXDP in that context because it would have to load and unload the BPF programs uh, for the networking interfaces. So if, you, if, you, if we take a moment and we set like two provisioning and deployment goals, the first is that we want to be able to provision, advertise, and manage a set of secondary networking interfaces for pods that want to use AFXDP, uh, and that those pods should be able to run without escalated privileges, then you need to use the AFXDP device plugin and CNI. And essentially, these two components complement each other to achieve the, the goals that we uh, list above. So just to walk you through maybe a snapshot of a pod that's created, and this pod is requesting an AFXDP resource, and we're just going to zone in on the net dev allocation uh, time aspect of it. Uh, Kubelet will invoke the AFXDP device plugin uh, with this allocate device function call. The AFXDP device plugin um, before BPF man integration was doing this loading of the eBPF program, which is the privileged operation. And then it would reply back to Kubelet saying, yeah, add this device to the device spec, but it would also request it to mount a Unix domain socket into the pod. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then at some stage, the AFXDP CNI would get invoked and the CNI has a number of things that it needs to do, but one of the things that it could do uh, alongside your BPF program, of course, is programming hardware filters on the, on the NIC itself so packets are delivered to the right queues. Um, and then at some stage, your AFXDP pod is up and running, your AFXDP application starts. Okay, so now we want to create an AFXDP socket. What do we need? Well, we need a reference to the BPF map that was loaded onto the NetDev by the device plugin. That reference is essentially a simple file descriptor. And this is where the UDS comes into play. So the application previously had to connect back to the device plugin over UDS, do this handshake, get this file descriptor, and then it could create the AFXDP socket and continue packet processing and doing all the cool stuff that it was intended to do from the beginning. And this is how we were able to achieve this kind of unprivileged model in that we exported the privileged operations out into the device plugin. Um, and I just wanted to highlight one other thing, I guess, is that in the pod deletion path, um, the CNI is what's invoked on pod deletion. The device plugin has no awareness uh, of, of deletion time. And so it had a responsibility of unloading the BPF program. So if we you know, consider those two privilege operations, the loading of the BPF program and the unloading of the BPF program, they actually created quite a number of requirements for the AFXTP device plugin and the CNI. Firstly, we had to store eBPF programs in our code base, uh, which created a lot of churn, especially when not a lot of our engineers uh, wrote eBPF programs. 
Uh, and it also meant that we had a very limited offering of what programs we could offer to, to folks on the networking interface. Secondly, the CNI runs as a binary on the host, right? So you have to statically link all of your dependencies into the CNI, which makes it bulky. You couldn't assume that libbpf or libxdp were available on the host. Um, and also had BPF code integrated in the CNI itself. And lastly, we had to do all this loading and unloading of programs, pinning of maps. And every time we went to upgrade like our base um, container image for the device plugin, there would be a different version of libbpf supported and we end up having to do some little bits of rewrite here and there, which actually again created quite a bit of churn for us in the project. So we decided to integrate with BPFman, um, and what we found were the benefits of that integration essentially was that we were able to remove all of the BPF code from our code base um, you know, and basically significantly reduce the churn for us. Um, it also meant that we no, uh, no longer need to statically link any dependency, dependencies in this, into the CNI, uh, simplifying it, making it smaller, which was another advantage. Uh, through the bytecode OCI image specification that's supported by BPF man, we actually can support a much more diverse set of programs uh, for the pod. You know, it can request anything as long as it has an a, a OCI image somewhere, uh, and BPF man has access to that image. And, um, you know, for, as a next level kind of integration, which is ongoing at the moment, we're also integrating with BPFman to take advantage of their con container storage interface driver, which would mean that our BPFFS is actually completely pinned inside the context of the pod. Uh, so we don't have to do this, pin something on a host, share it to a pod in a bi-directional fashion for the pod to access it. So if we review that snapshot again with a couple of updates, um, so without the CSI plugin, uh, you know, that alloc, function call comes into the AFXTP device plugin. It uses the BPF man client APIs to request it to load the program, the BPF program on the interface. Um, and then the device plugin reply back to Kubelet, this time with the device to add to the device spec. And before CSI integration, it would also give it uh, the, the pinned uh, map mount point to mount into the pod. And so eventually when your pod comes up, you might notice like there's no handshake anymore. Your pod can simply do BPF object get and it can start running and executing straight away. Uh, and I think getting rid of the handshake, to be honest with you, is a benefit for us because it placed a requirement on the application that I, I don't think it actually needed now that we can use BPF object get. And so with the container storage interface integration uh, side, uh, just like one other addition into the picture. Um, so let's start at the alloc call coming into the device plugin. BPF man loads the program on the interface. And the device plugin now is just going to set a few annotations on the pod, which are the XCP pro program name, the map name, and where to pin them inside the context of the pod. And then Kubelet will ask BPF man to actually mount that volume. Uh, inside, the, inside the pod uh, context. And when the pod is up and running, it has uh, a completely cordoned off BPF FS uh, with the map that it needs to itself, does BPF object get, and off it goes. Um, so, you know, th theory is obviously <laughs> uh, much more strong if it's supported by evidence. And what we did was we actually took uh, the open mobile evolved core uh, which is an open source 5G core data plane. It had, a, had, it had this UPF implementation specifically that was based on DPDK and SROV. We migrated it to AFXDP using that minus minus VDEV argument that we um, saw earlier on in the slides without making any changes to the app. And we actually have a demo recorded, but I won't show it today. I will leave people uh, watch that in their own time. Um, it's showing basically an unprivileged OMEC UPF pod coming up and it's being deployed by AFXP device plugin, CNI, and BPF man. Uh, in summary, you know, we found that there was a real development and maintenance cost to independently trying to manage eBPF inside our own infrastructure entity. And essentially, you know, I think the device plugin and the CNI are a real use case that show the benefit of leveraging a centralized uh, manager in Kubernetes. 
Thank you. Thank you for that talk. Now we have time for a couple of questions, if there are any. Um, did you agree on an interface between BPF Man and um, AFXDP uh, device plugin to make sure that, for example, BPF Man never breaks BPF um, AFXDP uh, device plugins? I don't, I don't think we had to make any agreement, to be honest with you. BPF Man works in a pretty standard way in how it loads um, programs on the interface. So the change was actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really honest, really simple. So the client, I just replaced all the code in the AFXDP device plugin that was previously loading, unloading BPF programs and so on with a BPF uh, client API call. It was that simple. Hi, great talk. Um, my experience with GPDK was usually to run it in a VM. So my question would be, do you have experience with uh, QMU and AFXDP or do you know if that works well or? Um, I've seen patches fly through on the mailing list quite recently for, uh, to integrate it. So I imagine, you know, native support will be coming relatively soon in that environment, yeah. Hey, uh, one, quest one question about uh, uh, the slide where you are running unprivileged BPF programs. Uh, did you have to, uh, do you happen to use it, uh, run it as a non-root user uh, or does it need to be a root user to run that? Um, uh, so I was taking like a very simple DPDK app which was already running as a root user but um, I think it should work in the non-root user context. I haven't uh, tried it. Okay. Um, I was trying to work on the premise that I was using DPDK as it would be deployed today. Right, okay, that's good to know because I tried this, uh, we couldn't get it to work. This was like several months ago, so things mm. might have changed. The other question to this was, did you have to enable that unprivileged BPF uh, flag in the kernel? Uh, no, but it, uh, not for the integration work that happened, no. But okay. um, in previous, work when we were using the device plugin natively, we, we did, yes. Right, and what kernel version were you using for this? Uh, for this, de the demo that we did, or yeah. just in general? I think oh, I used... Where you got it working. Yeah, so it was an Ubuntu um, image, and I think it was using a 5. Dot, it was more than 5.19, it was like 5. Dot something kernel, but it was above 5.19, yeah. Okay, that's fairly old, okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the image for the OMEC UPF was quite old, so I didn't have much of an option, unfortunately. It was LTS, Ubuntu, and kernel. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks for the talk. Uh, we're now going to...